Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Hey guys, Kevin Cruz here. Welcome to the LeadX Leadership Show, where we help you to stand out and to get ahead at work. Now, as you know, we like to switch things up here, keep it interesting, and to continue that tradition, today on the podcast, instead of me interviewing an expert guest, we're going to have the guest deep dive into their topic. You see, you'll be hearing audio from a LeadX webinar. Now, of course, there are dozens of great webinars on leadership, management, communication, productivity, and more, all archived in the LeadX app. Just visit leadx.org for more information about our webinar archive. So enough on the setup, enough background information. Here is Vanya Mathis to introduce our guest and to hand it over to them. Enjoy. Welcome to Master Your Motivation, three scientific truths for achieving your goals. Today, you're going to dispel popular theories of motivation that are outdated, unproven, or have been proven invalid. And you're going to explore how to create the choice, connection, and confidence that generates the optimal motivation required to achieve your goals and thrive. Our next host is on a mission to help individuals master their own motivation, achieve their goals, and flourish as they succeed. Widely known as one of the foremost experts on motivation and personal empowerment, she's also the co-author of the best-selling Self-Leadership and the One-Minute Manager with Ken Blanchard and the creator and lead developer of the Ken Blanchard Company's Self-Leadership, the best-in-class self-leadership and personal empowerment program. Please welcome Susan Fowler. Hello, I'm Susan Fowler. I am not a motivational speaker. I am a researcher, teacher, practitioner, consultant, author who speaks about motivation science. Now, the reason I think that's an important distinction is because we have been laboring for decades in the motivation dark ages. We have been working and living our lives based on motivational concepts, theories, and practices that actually have been either proven untrue, ineffective, and in some cases more harmful than helpful. So um, I have written these books, so excited about why motivating people doesn't work and what does, um, and also Master Your Motivation, which is brand new. And these books are um, really dedicated to helping you to take advantage of the new motivation science. It's, it's empirical, uh, it's, it's um, as I said, it's compelling, but also it's going to help you to understand the true nature of your motivation so you can achieve your goals and thrive and maybe even improve the quality of your life. Now, I, I know that sounds like kind of a grandiose statement, but I'd like you to think about this, that motivation is at the heart of everything you do. It's also at the heart of everything you don't do, but wish that you did. So I would love for you to think about something that you've been working on that hasn't quite come to fruition. Maybe it's a dream that you've dreamt if only you had the motivation to do it. Um, maybe it's something you've been procrastinating on. It could be something like losing weight or even uh, filling out your expense reports on time, uh, dealing with budgets more effectively, or maybe it's being able to really deal with that person that kind of makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up when you, when you think about them. So just think about anything that is creating pressure, stress, or that um, in some way is keeping you from doing what you think you really wanna do or don't do. <laughs> so here's, here's a, a really, it seems simple, but it's a groundbreaking insight. And that is that we long to thrive. So what we know through motivation science is that this is actually our basic nature, is to thrive. Now, the reason I say that that is, may be different is because if you really think about our workplaces, they're geared based on the idea that people are basically lazy or that we have to hold people accountable, or they won't do what we want them to do. And so I'd like you to think about how that makes you feel when you're at work. So maybe start to consider that um, if you thought that you or others are lazy and that we don't want to be productive, that that's actually a, a wrong-headed notion. The fact is, nobody wants to be bored. 
no one enjoys being lazy. I mean, there's times when we want to kick back, but in, in general, we actually appreciate a meaningful challenge. We, we want to make a contribution. We want to learn and grow every day. So this idea that people want to be disengaged is simply not true. So if that's true, if, if, um, if we long to thrive, then the real question becomes, how do we do that? How do we thrive? And that's where I get really excited about what we're learning through motivation, that, that, or the motivation science. That motivation, if you think about this, motivation is the energy to act. And it's the quality of your motivation that will determine the quality of your energy. So for too long, we have been hyper-focused on how much motivation we have. One of the things I'd love for you to, to think about differently um, after, after today is to never ask yourself, do I have motivation? Do I have the motivation? Do I have enough motivation? Or is he motivated or is she motivated? See, all of those questions are geared around this idea that motivation is all about the quantity that you have instead of the quality. Let me give you an analogy. Let's say that you don't have energy when you get up in the morning. And so you need to boost your blood sugar. It's like you have low blood sugar. So what do you often do? We will eat a, a, a sweet snack or we'll drink a cup of coffee or have a cola. So through the sugar, the carbs, the, the caffeine, we get that burst of energy. Now, what happens when we get that spike of energy? Well, we might actually have the energy to act in that moment, but we also, many of us have experienced this, our energy is not uh, high quality. That energy uh, does not necessarily foster the greatest creativity or innovation. It kind of gets us through that period of time. And then what happens? Our blood sugar falls. We crash. And when we crash, we actually, our blood sugar goes lower than it did before we had the caffeine, the sugar, the carbs. So what do we need? We need more. So all day long, we're on this roller coaster ride of trying to pump up our energy. And by the end of the day, it really takes a toll on our physical and mental well-being. Well, the same thing is true about motivation, that we actually oftentimes are succumbing to junk food motivation. There is a real difference in your energy between caffeine, carbs, and sugar, and eating a handful of almonds. And the same thing is true, as I said, with your motivation. The truth about motivation is this. Not all motivation is created equal. Some motivation is high quality and optimal. Sorry, my phone is just ringing. <laughs> um, and some motivation is low quality and suboptimal. And so what we want to do is we want to focus on how do we create motivation that is optimal, that is high quality. And I think that's a pretty exciting uh, prospect. In fact, this is what really gets me excited about the new science of motivation. And that is that we can create a, a breakthrough, a motivation breakthrough, if we are um, creating our three psychological needs for choice, connection, and competence. What the science says is that the way we thrive is when we are experiencing choice, connection, and competence. In the literature, these three psychological needs are referred to as autonomy, relatedness, and competence. So when those three psychological needs are, are generated in our lives, we thrive. And that's what's going to sustain our, uh, the quality of our energy and be, enable us to actually um, not only achieve our goals, but have mental and physical health. So here's what I think is a really exciting idea. It's kind of an evolutionary idea, if you will. And that is that motivation is a skill. You can experience optimal motivation anytime, anywhere, if you create choice, connection, and competence. So then, of course, that leads to the next question. And this is what I really hope to convey in our, our presentation today. And that is that you can create choice, connection, and competence, but you need to understand what they are and then how you can create them. So to create choice in our lives, that means that we need to perceive that we do have choices, that we recognize that we have freedom within boundaries, and that we have a sense of control over what's happening in our lives. So let me just give you um, an example of why it's so important to create choice. 
let's say that you want to go on a diet, you want to lose weight. So you say, whether you're on a formal plan or not, you say to yourself, oh, I, I, I really want to lose weight, so I can't eat that muffin. As soon as you say, oh, I can't eat that muffin, you have just eroded your sense, your perception of choice. And when you've done that, what is the thing you now need more than anything? It's not the muffin. <laughs> it's choice. And so you end up eating the muffin, not because you want the muffin, but because you need choice. And that gives you back that sense of, oh, I'm, I'm, I have a choice. So what we really need to do is really reframe our thinking. And that is to say, I have a choice. I have a choice to eat the muffin or not eat the muffin. And I'm choosing not to eat the muffin. Now, that might seem um, almost too simple. However, it is true that if you can just give yourself the perception of choice to recognize that you have freedom within boundaries and that you have a sense of control over your life, then you are one third of the way to mastering your motivation. Mastering your motivation requires all three psychological needs to be operational in your life. Otherwise, if one is, is gone, they're all, they're all done for. So how do you create choice or a sense of autonomy in your life? Here's what I would encourage you to do. Whenever you start to feel pressure, tension, stress, fear, if that's what's motivating you, then stop and ask yourself, hmm, what choices have I made? How do I feel about those choices and why? What choices could I make going forward? And do I feel that this situation has been imposed on me? Why do I feel that? The magic what, of what happens when you start to ask your questions just about the choices that you have is that sometimes just recognizing you have a choice is what empowers you to make the right choice. And what happens when you start to ask these questions is that you're actually creating a mindful moment. Neuroscience shows us that when you are in a state of mindfulness, that you actually are lighting up the same part of your brain that enables you to experience those three psychological needs of choice, connection, and competence. So there's really a method behind the madness here. I know, again, that it might just seem so simple, but the fact is it is powerful when we can um, ask ourselves questions as a way to actually experience choice. So the next time you feel like, oh, wow, I don't have any choices, I'm on a diet or whatever. Just remember, you always have choices. You don't have to turn in your expense reports on time. You don't have to do budgets. You don't have to attend that meeting. You don't have to pay your taxes. You don't have to do any of those things. Once you recognize that, then you start to explore the freedom you do have within boundaries. And that's where creativity, innovation, and your sense of control are, are yielded back to you. So that's choice. What about connection? We need, in addition to choice, we also need to create connection in our lives. So we need to feel a sense of belonging and genuine connection to others without concerns for ulterior motives. You know, think about one of the reasons that we languish in the workplace is that we feel that oftentimes our managers, our leaders, they don't really care about us as human beings, as individuals, but as simply cogs in the wheel or a way for people to achieve their goals. So it's really important for us to have those genuine connections, especially at work. I think this is one of the places we can really improve the quality of our lives is by improving the quality of our relationships at work. We also need to align our goals and actions to meaningful values and a sense of purpose. This means you need to know what your values are and you need to have a sense of purpose. Um, and too often in our organizations, what's happening is that the organist, I mean, I, I think this is an interesting phenomenon. In our organizations, we have our values and our purpose and our mission. And in fact, I talk to so many people that can tell me what the five values of their organization are. And then I say, and what are your values? What are the values that you make decisions with every day? What are the values that you bring to um, the moment uh, that, that guide your behavior? 
And a lot of us aren't really clear. And, and in fact, most of us are operating on what's called programmed values. Those are the values that we attain um, through the generation that we were born in. So when you hear about baby boomers and Gen Xers and Gen Yers, all of that is program values. But no matter what your generation is, you have an opportunity to experience connection by developing your values, by being thoughtful about your values. That's one of the things I really write about in my book is how do you, how do you move from programmed values that are generationally based to develop values that really reflect who you are, what you want to be, and what you want to accomplish, and, and, and how you can contribute to the greater good, because that's the third aspect of creating connection, is you want to contribute to something greater than yourself. So one of the reasons that we don't achieve our goals is because we fail to connect to those goals in a more meaningful way. You know, again, going back to just this easy example, because most of us have tried diets or exercise programs, is that we fail to think about why we really want to lose weight or why we really want to be in an exercise program. Most of us do it out of feeling pressure, stress, guilt, shame. All of those are suboptimal reasons for engaging in any activity. But if we can say to ourselves, wow, you know, um, my identity is as a healthy human being that, that contributes to the greater good. And if I am healthy through the way I eat or the way I treat my body, the way I exercise, then I'm going to be able to make a greater contribution. You know, when my husband was on a weight loss plan, it was really fascinating. Um, I would ask him these questions. I would ask him about choice. I would say, what are the choices you made this week? What choices are you glad you made? Uh, what choices could you make going forward? And then I would ask him questions about why are you losing weight again? Um, you know, what, what values do you have around losing your weight? And in the beginning, it was because Drea had always been an athlete. And so when he looked in the mirror, he didn't see himself anymore. He couldn't identify with the person he saw in the mirror. And so he wanted to lose weight to really um, be congruent with the person that he really felt he was. But as I continued asking the questions over the course of him losing weight, it really became clear that another reason he wanted to lose weight was he wanted to be healthy for his granddaughters. He wanted to be that, that father, that grandfather, father and grandfather, who could participate with his children uh, fully. And that gave his diet so much more meaning. I remember talking to a man named Roland when I lived in North Carolina. And Roland's family had always been involved in the tobacco industry. And he almost felt that it was his duty <laughs> to smoke because uh, that had been his life and his, you know, for generations, that had been a livelihood for his family. But his doctor told him he had to quit or he was gonna die. Isn't that interesting? Live or die, smoke or die, or smoke and die. And yet he kept smoking. He knew he shouldn't. He felt guilty for doing it. So he started doing things like he wore a patch, but then he kept smoking and it made him nauseous. He uh, went to classes and would have to take a break and go out and smoke. <laughs> um, he, he actually discovered that there was an acupressure point in your ear that reduces cravings. So he had his ear stapled, nothing worked. So one day he's in his car and he's driving and he's smoking a cigarette. And his daughter, three-year-old daughter, is in the back seat, and she screams out at him, Dad, please quit, quit smoking. You're killing me back here. And Roland said he put out that cigarette, and he never smoked again. Now, what happened there? You know, I think we've all probably had an experience. I know I became a vegetarian overnight. I was the person who had the, the pot of pork fat on my, on my um, stove because everything tasted better with pork fat. And overnight, I became a vegetarian. That was over 35 years ago, almost 40 years ago. We've probably all had experiences where we either started doing something or stopped doing something, and it was actually easy. If you really stop to think about why that happened, and that's what, where I started studying the science of motivation, why does that happen? And almost always, it's because we find something we love more than we love the bad habit. Or we find something we love in the goal that compels us or impels us to act differently. So this whole idea of creating connection 
is so, so powerful. And in our organizations, oftentimes we're having to deal with metrics without meaning. We're being held accountable to do things that we don't understand why we should do them. So what we really need to do is to ask ourselves when it comes to my goal or situation, how can this give me a greater sense of belonging and genuine connection to others? Is this goal or situation meaningful to me? Why? And if I feel that what is being asked of me is not just, what do I need to make it fair and why? So this whole idea of going through our lives, creating connection, is a powerful, powerful way of sustaining our motivation optimally. So we need to attribute meaning to the madness around us. If change is happening, whatever's going on, we really need to attribute meaning to it. And that means understanding our values, contributing to the greater good, and making sure that we have genuine connections to people. So that leads us to the third psychological need, which is to create competence. And competence is our need to feel effective at managing everyday situations. It's demonstrating skill over time. It's not enough to just think we're competent. It's not enough to just believe we can do it. I mean, we've seen enough of those singers like on American Idol or Indonesian Idol or UK Idol or whatever show you watch, Canadian Idol, where people really have the confidence that they can sing, but they actually aren't competent and no one's ever loved them enough to tell them the truth. You know, the fact is feedback doesn't have to kill your dreams. In fact, feedback, honest feedback, if we internalize it as a gift, is the very thing we need to be able to demonstrate skill over time. And we need to um, sense our, our growth and learning every day. Um, I, I get really frustrated um, in the workplace because we tend to focus on results and outcomes instead of learning and growth. Just imagine if at the end of every day, instead of being asked or instead of asking ourselves, what did I accomplish today? You know, how much, how much, you know, cl uh, closer am I to achieving my numbers? You know, what ranking did I reach today? What if instead we were to ask, what did I learn today? How did I grow? What did I learn that will help me be better tomorrow? How did I grow in a way that might actually help me help others? So this is a really important um, aspect of our motivation that I think we forget. We find joy in learning. We long to master our, uh, the world around us. So simply asking ourselves when we're feeling like our energy is low or we're not motivated enough for our goal, what we want to do is shift from the quantity of our motivation to the quality of our motivation. And we can do that by asking, wow, what am I learning? Or what have I learned? What skills or experience do I have that might prove helpful? What new skills could I develop? What insights have I gained or might I gain that could help me moving forward? So your nature is to grow and learn every single day. You know, think about that if you're on a diet. What did I learn? When I asked my husband about that, he said, wow, I learned that I enjoy a hamburger wrapped in lettuce as much as I do the bun. I also learned that I could ask for half um, of the French fries. You know, I pay for a full pack of French fries, but I only ask him for half. Uh, one time I asked him, what did you learn this week? And he goes, you know, I learned that red onions have less calories than white onions. I go, wow, why is that? He goes, I don't know. So then he discovered it. He found out that red onions actually have less sugar content than white onions. He'll never forget that. And now whenever he has a choice, he takes red onions instead of white onions. But, it, you know, that's not even the point. The point is it made him feel good. He actually was enjoying losing weight because he recognized that he was learning and growing, gaining in competence. It's so, so important. So we think, I think, I hope you think that the time has come to challenge what you think motivation is and isn't. Right now in the workplace, if you look at the competencies that leaders are being held accountable to achieve, if you look at the types of motivational practices that you're being um, prodded and, and, and bribed with, almost all of those motivational tactics are based on Behavioral studies done on animals in the 1940s, where we came up with B.F. Skinner's carrot and sticks. 
based on Maslow's hierarchy of, of needs, which Maslow didn't even create. He created the whole need theory, which, yay, it's, it's, it's resulted in a lot of the, the research that we have today, but he didn't even create his own um, triangle. Uh, the, the Maslow's hierarchy of learning was, was made popular through an advertising campaign that Maslow had nothing to do with. So Maslow's hierarchy has never been proven. So here's the truth. The truth is you can actually self-actualize anytime, anywhere you choose if you choose to create choice, a connection, and competence. And then a lot of the motivation theory at work is based on achievement theory, where it's based on leadership power. And I'd like to share with you that um, I've actually done um, a, a lot of research and been um, published in academic journals. And if you would like to, to get that information, like uh, the uh, advances in human resources um, piece toward a new curriculum of leadership competencies, advances in motivation, science, cultural rethinking, leadership development. Um, that talks about Maslow and B.F. Skinner and McClellan's achievement theory and, and what we now know that's so different than what's really the undergirding for most of our um, motivation in the workplace. So if you're interested um, in uh, getting some of these papers, there's three papers that you would receive, you can just text the word articles to 66866 and you'll be prompted and you will automatically receive these three um, papers. If you are um, doing this internationally, the text won't work, but if you contact me, um, I'll give you my contact information. I'll be glad to send them to you. So shift happens when you proactively create choice, connection, and competence. The shift from suboptimal to optimal motivation. And I'd like to just share a quick story of, of how I put this into practice. I travel a lot for my work and I was at the airport and I'm, I'm usually under pressure and I'm really stressed because I try to pile too much into, into a short amount of time and I'm very competitive. And so I'm, I'm searching the TSA lines and I'm looking for three things. I'm looking for a line without a family. I'm looking for a line without a lot of men because men are really fastidious about the way they put things in the bins, whereas most women just throw our stuff in and go. <laughs> That's probably a sexist remark, but I think it's true. And um, I'm looking for a TSA agent that's not really caught up in all the protocol and, you know, we'll kind of let things go through faster. So I try to get in the shortest line. And this particular day, I'm like so stressed out because I'm looking for the best line. And I have to laugh at myself because here I am getting on a plane to go talk about optimal motivation and how to reduce the pressure and stress and how to elevate the quality of your life through optimal motivation. And I'm laughing at myself and I guess, you know, maybe it would be good to practice what I teach. And I go, okay, so I need to shift my motivation because I'm obviously feeling very imposed. I'm feeling like I don't have any choice because I have to go through security, right? And so I think, okay, I am choosing to go through security because I'm choosing to go on this trip because I love the work I do. And I need to make a better connection. I already have the competence. So how can I better create connection going through security? And so I started to think about that. How can I align going through security with one of my values? So I think about what are my values? And one of my top values is learning. So I think, what can I learn going through security? And that would also gain competence. And it might even help my sense of choice. And I think, hmm, I could learn patience because I obviously don't have a lot of that. So how would I learn patience? I would learn patience by um, going through the longest line. So I, I find a line and it's a doozy. It's got a family. It's not just a family. It is a family of a young couple with two kids, uh, a toddler and a newborn. They have more stuff that I realized you could even take through security. And I stand behind them and the father says, oh, you want to go ahead of us? It could take a while. I go, oh, no, no, thank you. And to myself, I say, oh, I'm practicing patience. So I'm watching them and it's actually painful as they're trying to put all their stuff on the, on the belt. And I, 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 I finally said, um, excuse me, I, I hope you don't think this is strange, but would it help if I held your baby? And they said, oh, would you? That would be fabulous. So I'm holding this darling newborn baby and they're getting all their stuff on and they start to go through security. I go, excuse me, excuse me, um, do you want your baby? And they go, oh, oh yeah, our baby. So I hand them the baby. On the other side, I hold the baby again and uh, they pack up and we go on our way to our gates. And I'm at the gate and I'm thinking, well, wow, that was really fun. I actually got to hold a baby and I really enjoy holding babies. And then I saw the father approaching me and he, he comes up, he goes, oh, I'm so glad I found you. He said, 
we're embarrassed. We didn't even thank you. This is the first time that we've ever traveled with two kids and we had no idea how hard it would be. And we don't think we could have gotten through, through security without you. And we just wanted you to know that we appreciated you. You really made a difference in our, in our day. And I'm like, oh no, thank you. It was, it was, it was my pleasure. And after we stopped thanking each other, I, I got on the plane and I'm going, wow, that's amazing. My life purpose is to be a catalyst for good. And by practicing patience, I not only got to hold a baby, which I love to do, but I also got to actually fulfill my life purpose to be a catalyst for good. And this might sound crazy, but now every time I go through security, I'm looking forward to it. I'm making choices. How can I be of service? How can I contribute to the greater good? So that's just a little demonstration of how if you are creating choice, connection, and competence, that you can literally shift the quality of your energy, the quality of your motivation, and, and live life at a very different level. So when you create choice, connection, and competence, you flourish and you achieve your goals. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my presentation today. I hope that we can connect deeper, um, that we can communicate through social media. You can always, always contact me on my website at susanfowler.com. And I would love to hear from you. And I'd love to hear how you practice um, creating choice, connection, and competence in your life and achieve your goals and thrive while you're doing it. Friends, if you like this episode of the LeadX Leadership Podcast, please take a minute, leave a rating on iTunes or Stitcher. Ratings are invaluable for attracting new listeners. And I like to convert those listeners into leaders because you know I'm on a mission to spark 100 million leaders in the next 10 years. And if you wanna become the boss everyone fights to work for and nobody wants to leave, check out the LeadX platform with Coach Amanda at leadx.org. And if you have 10 or more managers who could use some binge-worthy training, send me an email at info at leadx.org, L-E-A-D-X dot O-R-G, and we'll talk about getting you set up with a totally free pilot for those managers. See if they like it. If they don't, that's fine. We go away. Part as friends. But if they love it, you've just found yourself a new resource for them. Remember, leadership is influence. You're always leading. How are you going to lead today? <laughs>